if I can just introduce myself, I'm Kirby Eichen, Chairman of the NSS Executive Committee. Uh, some of you may have seen my photo out on the board. You probably may not recognise the photo from Matt Astor because I wear different glasses these days. I like to go incognito. We have uh, today a very special speaker, uh, one that I'm certainly looking forward to hearing and who I think will play uh, an interesting and important role in the future of commercial space activity and space development. Uh, Jim Benson has a Bachelor of Science degree in Geology, uh, which is also an interesting background given what this project is going to be about. However, his first 30 years has been spent working in computer-related fields. Uh, Jim has sold two software-related companies and then retired to the beautiful climate of Colorado. Uh, however, having done that, he was then seeking some kind of personal challenge in life and uh, settled upon the field of commercial space to challenge himself personally and hopefully to help make some inroads in developing this particularly important field to all of us at the National Space Society. Jim is now uh, the chairman of and CEO of Space Dev. Uh, it's a project that's particularly important and I'll let him tell you more about it. So if I can please introduce Jim Benson. Thank you, Kirby. Can you hear me all right? I want to uh, thank Peter and uh, everybody at the NS uh, National Space Society who are responsible for uh, getting me here. I'm uh, proud to be here and also proud to be nominated to, uh, to the board. So uh, be sure to vote for me. I'm supposed to campaign. That was my campaign, that, that was my campaign speech. Um, how many of you saw on the way to the hotel the bulletin board that said rain, snow, asteroids, whatever? Chevy Blazer, built like a rock. <laughs> well, hopefully we're going to be seeing a lot more of that. Uh, it wasn't until I started getting actively involved in space that I realized how many television commercials and magazine advertisements have a space theme. It's just incredible how deeply embedded space is in all of our lives, and I think the general public isn't very aware of what a role space has played throughout their lives, and uh, it's the activists and the grassroots people uh, with organizations like this one that help keep that alive and uh, fan the flames to uh, keep the space program alive. Last night I started reading a book uh, by Greg Bear called Slant. Yes, I read science fiction. I started reading science fiction in uh, 1955. I just want to quote one sentence from the very beginning of the book. Data flow today is money like blood, the living substance of our human rivers like arteries. You can steamboat the big flow or slowly raft these rivers up and down the world or canoe into the branches and the backwaters. I thought that was kind of interesting because the... the project that I've embarked on, the Near Earth Asteroid Prospector, is going after data. When you, when you go into space, mass is so important that drives the cost of everything. So if you can bring a product back that has no mass, but has high value, then you increase your probability of success. And that's exactly what all of our science missions are about. It's sending very expensive and massive uh, spacecraft into space in order to send back highly valuable and massless data. So that data flow is equivalent to money in the sense that the near-Earth asteroid rendezvous mission that NASA is flying right now has a cost of $225 million that you and I have paid for. It's flying five instruments, and those five instruments are creating new scientific knowledge at a cost of $45 million per instrument or data set or set of new knowledge. So money and data are very much equivalent in this case. And it was thinking about how can we boost uh, the public interest in space, how can we get humanity into space that, uh, that got me involved in this project. And let me give you just a, a, a quick analogy that I just uh, thought of a couple of weeks ago. I've never been a, uh, a surfer, I tried to surf uh, when I was a teenager and I could never 
get to the point where I could stand up on the board. So I'm just describing this as a, a secondhand experience. But think about somebody who goes out to surf. They get their board and they go out into the water and they paddle out into, uh, into the water and they lay there on their board and they're kind of facing in towards shore because they know what direction they want to go, but they're always looking back behind them to see if there's a wave coming that's big enough to catch. So when they see a wave coming, they start swimming forward and if they get up enough speed and uh, they time it just right with the wave, they can catch that wave and ride it. And then of course the goal is to, uh, to ride it as long as you can. In um, about 20 years ago this year, a huge wave came by and it's still being ridden by a lot of people. In fact, uh, society is still riding this wave. Roughly in 1978, 20 years ago, the microcomputer revolution started. But most people didn't know that it had started because it was little companies uh, like Radio Shack putting out the TRS-80 computer and Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak building the Apple II in the garage and uh, uh, college dropout Bill Gates uh, you know, writing uh, you know, computer language uh, you know, pra practically on his dining room table. All these people were at the grassroots and they were below the radar screen of the industry analysts and the uh, industry pundits and uh, the investment banking community and the venture capitalists. If anybody had gone to IBM or Burroughs or CDC or Univac or Honeywell or any of the other big mainframe manufacturers, none of which exist today except IBM, if anyone had gone to them and said, what does your future hold in store with uh, these microcomputers like the TRS-80 and the Apple II, uh, if they even uh, considered an answer, they would have brushed it off with the back of their hand and said, you know, these things uh, obviously are not important, uh, we don't care about them, and they're so small that there's no way that they can affect our, uh, our mainframe uh, livelihoods. So 20 years ago, I was uh, earning a living you know, working eight to five and uh, supporting a family, and uh, but had been in the computer field already for 20 years, starting off in the mainframe arena and moving into many computers. And I saw that maybe I could buy a little microcomputer myself because I was writing books at the time. I was in the environmental movement, giving speeches and writing books and doing political organizing around the country. And I was really getting tired of retyping the same manuscript over and over again and using whiteout and uh, correcting tape to, uh, to to do these books, and I thought, gee, I could buy a little microcomputer, running this thing called CPM and VisiCalc and uh, DBase2 and uh, WordStar, and uh, I can actually write books and sort of do you know practical things with this. And I took the plunge and got a little microcomputer, and uh, and already being fascinated with computers, I got more and more involved uh, as they started to evolve and grow and become more powerful and software started developing. And as you know, in 1981, that's when IBM brought out the PC and by having their name on it, that uh, sort of validated the concept of microcomputers. But, you know, there was KG, uh, you know, Bill Gates who uh, signed up for doing the operating system, but not as an exclusive. He allowed the right to, uh, you know, run his own business with his own version of the operating system. Uh, which is probably what did IBM and a lot of the mainframe companies in uh, as short as 10 years after that. So basically, what was happening at that point is this big wave was building, and I could feel it building all around me because I was already in that business. And I could see that this was going to be an enormous wave and that it was going to affect society for a long time. And I tried to figure out how I could catch that wave and become a part of it. And I would go to bed uh, frustrated at night because I could, I would think to myself, well, gee, if you would take this brand new little diskette thing instead of a big 8-inch disk, and if you could get a little CRT screen, you could probably pack this into a small suitcase and have a portable computer. And then six or nine months or a year later, there was the portable computer just like I had uh, imagined it. And that happened to me over and over again. And believe me, it was extremely frustrating being so knowledgeable about the industry and not being able to do anything about it and being right in the middle of it but not being able to do anything other than just buy one and, and be a user. So this huge wave basically passed me by. But that wave is still going on today and the microcomputer revolution is driving over a third of the economy of all of the industrialized countries. So don't underestimate uh, what that has done for us and what it's continuing to do for us. Now after that, and at the time I thought, well, 
I'm only 30 years old. Uh, that's not so bad. Uh, a lot of waves have come through. There were, uh, you know, many computer waves before that. And since then, there's been uh, genetic engineering. And the wave that's just starting to taper off right now is the internet wave. When that started picking up steam, people were only two years ago, two and a half years ago, most people had nothing to do with the internet. They weren't familiar with it. Wall Street didn't know what it was. It was a bunch of hackers and, you know, high school kids. And, uh, and all of a sudden, they realized that money could be made on it. And uh, literally, I could, if you know the right people and you take any company that's even remotely related to the internet, you put the internet in the name of the company, you can go to Wall Street and make money right now. And that's what this feeding frenzy is all about. And this internet wave that's rolling through society and changing us and making a lot of people a lot of money. And it's going to be changing our lives uh, you know, for the rest of civilization as it uh, filters on out over the years. So these waves come through society periodically, and if you just wait long enough and keep your eyes open, you can see them coming. Well, when I retired uh, in uh, the fall of 1995, I went to Colorado. I didn't have to work again. I got bored after five months, six months of uh, traveling around, and I thought, I really need to do something here different because I can get back into the computer field and make some more money there, but there's just no motivation anymore. I've sort of done it for 30 years, and there wasn't uh, any excitement. So I thought, what is it that I've been interested in all my life? What would I like to do that would be personally interesting and challenging? And what I chose was a combination of my lifelong interest in science, technology, and astronomy. And I came up with space and space commercialization. I spent many months analyzing possible commercial applications for space. I looked at Earth orbiting, Moon, near-Earth objects, Mars, and elsewhere, and I came up dry. I could not think of a single thing that would make money in space beyond orbiting communication satellites and remote sensing, which are already too expensive to get into. So I was left dry, but not believing that that was really the case. I looked at the NASA's near-Earth asteroid rendezvous because near-Earth objects had stuck in my mind. Near-Earth objects, if we're in an orbit like this around the sun, near-Earth objects are also in orbits like this around the sun. Some of them cross over our orbit, and some go outside, some go a little inside, but basically they're right here in the vicinity. That makes them really easy to get to from an energy point of view. In space, as you know, energy is money. The more energy you require, the bigger the rocket, the more expensive, and the harder it is to get it done. So you want to find a mission that requires the least amount of energy in the smallest rocket. Well, near-Earth objects, every one of them are valuable. Even one mile in diameter made out of stone is worth a trillion dollars or more in the mineral content if it were on Earth at today's prices. So there's a, there are a lot of reasons for being interested in near-Earth objects. They can be supply the material that gets humanity up off of this planet and provides the basis for going to the moon and to Mars and elsewhere. So. I kept thinking about near-Earth objects, near-Earth objects, and then I read on the internet about the near-Earth asteroid rendezvous mission. $225 million, five instruments, $45 million per data set, and it suddenly dawned on me, well, it didn't suddenly, it gradually dawned on me, that the private sector can do anything cheaper than the government. I mean, I think most of you will agree with that just, you know, from your own practical experience, that if the government is doing something, well, you know, it could probably be done more efficiently. So that was one thing to look at. The second thing was, well, what are we even doing this for in the first place? Well, it turns out that science has a value. It's what keeps humanity moving forward. Therefore, society is willing to pay a lot of uh, money for new knowledge. So when you think about the space program that humanity has, we're spending over $2 billion a year bringing back scientific data from space. That means there's an existing market right now worth $2 billion a year that nobody is doing except governments, and governments are inefficient. Therefore, doesn't it make sense that maybe a private company can crack into this existing $2 billion market? and bring back more science for less money? Well, that was the basis of the near-Earth asteroid prospector that we started off on just a little over a year ago. And the way we did it is, uh, as I got involved at the University of California in San Diego, they assigned a bunch of undergraduate students, three professors, and some industry mentors to help the students. And within, um, by the end of the summer of just last year, we had a preliminary mission and a preliminary spacecraft design. In the meantime, I went to Washington and I tried to figure out 
how can I present this in such a way that it won't be uh, viewed as a threat to NASA and that I don't step on any toes or make any enemies? Because it's very important to not make enemies in life. Enemies are permanent, friends are temporary. So you want to make as few enemies as you can because they're going to be with you the rest of your life. So I went to some, uh, I went to the March storm and, uh, in March of last year and participated in that excellent uh, activity. And um, during the citizen interview with Dan Golden, there were 50 of us March stormers or um, you know, uh, citizen lobbyists sitting here. And Dan Golden is out here, and we were supposed to have an hour-long dialogue, but uh, Senator Warbacher get, got up and blabbed for a few minutes, and then uh, Golden got up and blabbed for a few minutes, and pretty soon it was obvious that there were only going to be two questions uh, before the hour was up. Well, to make a long story short, I asked him about uh, was there anything that would stop NASA from buying commercially available data if a private mission went out and um, you know, brought the data back? And he misunderstood that I was looking for government subsidy because everybody who goes to NASA is looking for a subsidy. And uh, he assumed that that was the case with me. And we literally got into an argument. And um, you know, we were almost yelling at each other, but not quite. And finally I was saying, you're not listening to what I'm saying. And he's saying, you're not listening to what I'm saying. And he said, write your proposal and send it to NASA. And I said, I'm not a government contractor. I will never be a government contractor. I don't want to send in a proposal. This is a private mission. And he said, no, it's a discovery program. And I said, I'm sorry. I'm not communicating well. Forget it. So I backed up and uh, went in another way. We went in through Gene Shoemaker, who helped uh, get me to Dr. Wes Huntress, uh, the Associate Administrator for Science, uh, who has since um, resigned and is now uh, agreed to be on a, uh, a member of our Board of Directors when he leaves in, uh, in September. But the, what we sold NASA, I've listened to what Dan Golden said when he was yelling at me, and he was basically <coughs> saying, the U.S. government is not a venture capitalist, it's not an investment banker, we don't like people coming to us looking for subsidies. We don't like people going behind our backs to Congress and making us do things that we don't want to do. And you know, he basically ranted about all of these things that you know he's fed up with in terms of uh, you know people selling him a bill of goods when it comes to uh, you know getting into space. So I wrote all that down and thought, okay, I, I need to factor this in. So when we briefed him, Dan Golden, Wes Hunters, uh, Alan Landwick later, I tried to say things that I knew were positive to them. I said, I don't want any subsidies. I'm not asking for venture capital. I'm not asking for investment banking. You know, we will work within the peer review process. We will fund this privately. And I said all the right things. And essentially, it was an exercise in painting Dan Golden into a corner using his own words. <laughs> because if you took everything that he said, do, and everything that he said, don't do, and you said, this is what I'm going to do, and this is what I'm not going to do, isn't that what you want? Uh, the conclusion was yes. And surprisingly, I didn't really have to coerce him at all. Dan Golden <laughs> wants space commercialization to happen, and he and others at the top of the agency are willing to help to get it done. Wes Hunter specifically added in missions of opportunity into the discovery program. That means that NASA will fund non-NASA missions for scientific knowledge acquisition. So now our near-Earth asteroid prospector is recognized by NASA as a discovery mission of opportunity. And last week, we were announced that we were recognized as a mid-X or mid-range explorer mission of opportunity. So what we've been doing for the last several months is we've been going out to scientific groups and saying, here's our commercial price list. We're selling rides on our mission for 10 or $12 million. If you scientists would like to get a ride, take this off of our commercial price list, add the cost of this ride into your proposal, submit your proposal to NASA, and if it's a good proposal, you'll receive funding, and that's the peer review process, so NASA's happy, and now you buy your ride from me, the university, you buy it from me, and now I'm happy because I got a commercial sale, and I'm not a government contractor, and I'm not taking government money, I'm taking university money or national uh, naval research lab money or whatever. Indirectly from the government, yes, but I'm doing commercial contracts with another party, and that's all I care about. So we have this implicit agreement that we will be a commercial ride, and that NASA will not be involved in telling us what to do, and we won't let them tell us what to do, because we're not even dealing with NASA. Seven scientific groups, three universities, a national, uh, three, one national lab, and three NASA centers all notified NASA formally that they intend to submit a proposal to seek funds from the Discovery Program to buy a ride from us. That's a total possible revenue of $76 million if they were to be successful. 
our mission is going to cost under $50 million. I took the company public last October, and we uh, sort of settled in at about a dollar and a half. That made the company worth $15 million. In February, we acquired a little aerospace engineering company out in San Diego that sort of got the right mindset to do things small and cheap. And uh, that got the stock up to around $3. Right now, we're around 2 That makes the company worth about $30 million. And we're in the process of bringing on some key people right now and making some announcements soon that should be important. One of the points that I want to get across here is that by going public, we have made it possible for every single one of you to go out and buy a share of stock for $2 if you want to and be a part owner of the first private exploration company that's going into space. You can be a real space activist in terms of helping entities other than the government getting into space. If we can go into space and make money, I believe it's going to be like breaking the four minute mile. No one thought the human body could run a mile in four minutes until it was done and then all of a sudden it became relatively commonplace. Well, most people just sort of assume that you can't go to space if you're not NASA. Well, that's simply not true. NASA is a means to an end. And as Dan Golden says, when, when anything becomes routine at NASA, we don't want to do it anymore. If you can show us how you can do something better, cheaper, and faster, then you can have it. Because NASA wants to take their money, our money, taxpayer money, and put it into more advanced uh, and risky technology. They want to be out exploring the outer planets and doing interplanetary missions and solar sails and finding planets around uh, other suns and other solar systems. They don't want to be doing routine planetary missions. It's time for us to do it just as the private sector took over communication satellites from governments who were the only ones doing it in the beginning. And when it started making money, the private sector moved in, and now it's a $70 billion a year market. The same thing is true for space exploration. You're looking at the beginning of it right now. A new wave is growing. I can see it back here already, and it's a bigger wave than the microcomputer wave because space is a hell of a lot bigger than microcomputers are. And I'm paddling like crazy, and this wave's coming on, and I invite everybody else to jump in and start paddling like crazy too because this wave's going to pass you by if you don't get up to speed. But if you can catch it and become part of it, you can ride this wave the rest of your lives because this is the biggest wave that's coming along, and I feel so fortunate to have stumbled into this in time, uh, this time, and not have to see something so important that I've been interested in all my life, uh, you know, sort of go by me again. So, you know, I'm, I'm inviting all of you to be activists, not in the sense of just supporting the NASA budget, budget whatever that may be. That's not really very helpful. Get out there and support the companies that are making space happen. We need public access to space. When people can get out to space, then we've got it made. We've, we'll have the ability to have sustainable settlements elsewhere so that if we ever get whacked by a space iceberg, uh, you know, we'll be able to survive as humanity. And by the way, space icebergs aren't so bad either. Space <laughs> icebergs are concentrated energy. That's water. You electrolyze the water, and you've got hydrogen and oxygen, and you've got fuel. Ultimately, that's what I'm looking for. Robert Heinlein said that when you get to Earth orbit, you're halfway to anywhere. And that means you've expended half the energy to get anywhere else in the solar system. And if you can get up there and find a little iceberg and refuel, then we can go anywhere and the universe is the limit. So we've got to get up off this planet, and it's only going to happen uh, when space pays to be there. So if you want to work in space or visit space or live in space, space has got to pay. So we've got to find one little way after another of making space pay, and then the tide's going to rise and all the boats are going to go up with it, and we'll get to space. But we've got to become uh, you know, more in tune with what it's going to take to get us there, and not just the NASA budget. NASA can only take us part of the way. We need entrepreneurialism, we need risk taking, and we need uh, out of the box thinking, to borrow a phrase. And all of you are part of that. And you're already playing a part of it, and you can play a bigger part, and you can help recruit more people so that we can just accelerate uh, moving this industrial revolution infrastructure off of the planet into space, and then we're, we can all go there. Uh, I can probably give uh, about uh, 10 minutes for questions if you'd like, but thanks, thanks for listening. Uh, how to catch this wave. 
Um, you know, there are all different ways of doing that. If, uh, if you have business experience, that's probably the most needed thing in the space arena, I have found. There's a big lack of business experience in taking all these wonderful ideas and turning, turning them into something that can make a profit. Because if you can't make a profit, nothing can happen. That's really a key thing. But it's also important that the companies be supported that are doing this, that the organizations like uh, NSS need to be supported with uh, more members and contributions and a broader perspective in terms of what it means to be an activist. Uh, so there, I mean, everybody has a role to play, but in, in all kinds of different ways. And it's, I think each person needs to think about their own skills and their own background and how they can contribute something to, you know, sort of catching the wave on their own and uh, you know, sort of helping out in, in general. Yeah. After the first mission, what would be the second step? Um, well, that's actually a pretty good, uh, that's a good question. What would we do uh, after a first successful mission? There are several possibilities that we're looking at. One, which is my favorite, but I think the government's going to uh, sort of foreclose this one fairly soon. Uh, there are so many missions going to Mars, and every one so far plans on having both a lander and an orbiter. They need an orbiter to get the data up off the ground and send it back to Earth. I would very much like to send a commercial data relay satellite to Mars put it in orbit for 10 years and sell time on it to all of the landers that are going so that the cost of the uh, future Mars missions could be lower and just concentrate on accomplishing stuff on the ground instead of spending half the money on an orbiter. So I'd like to see a commercial data communication satellite in, uh, in orbit around Mars. There are three really important things that we need in space to bring the infrastructure up there so that we can all go out there and you know, play and work. And that is energy, communications, and transportation. We're already doing transportation because we're selling rides. Uh, we will be dropping instruments down to the surface of the asteroid, relaying the data up to the mothership and back to Earth. So we're going to model that on the same uh, radio communications equipment that we would propose to use on a Mars data orbiting satellite. <coughs> Another possibility is using electric propulsion that already exists and one of the national labs is trying to find money to give us one so that we can go out and do a single mission that maybe goes by a dozen near-Earth asteroids because we really need to find, do a resource assessment. What's out there, what are they made out of, uh, and what values do they have to us in the future in terms of water or uh, carbonaceous materials or whatever. There are so many different missions that can be done because it's a $2 billion a year market right now, and all we have to do is just think of interesting scientific things that need to be done and how to do those missions um, for a profit. That's just the beginning, though, of relying on science. Then we've got to move it into the commercial sector. But we're not going to get the commercial sector interested until we've proven that a commercial company can actually make money in space. So we're hoping that once we're successful, then mining companies and engineering companies will say, oh, well, if they can do it, mm, look what they found. Maybe we should get involved. Yeah. Uh, since you've offered us stock, you have copies here for Spectus with you? Um, <laughs> well, thanks, thanks for asking. Uh, we're actually doing a private placement right now for about a million dollars. That's going uh, pretty well. After that happens, we're going to become what's called a, a reporting company, which means we graduate uh, in, in terms of the SEC by starting to file all of our audited reports with them on a regular basis, and that gives us sort of more credibility within the market. Um, probably the best thing, if you're interested, our stock symbol is SPDV. It's about $2 a share, and I can't advise you to buy it or not. I mean, we're a risk like any other startup company is. But we don't have any mechanism in place right now that would allow you to buy stock and put money in our company that we could use immediately. It's almost as important for you just to go out and uh, you know buy some stock and hold on to it and hope we turn into Microsoft. I'm not promising that. <laughs> uh, lots of questions. Let me work you know, across this way. Yeah. I've got a comment today. It's the fact. It's a fact. You know, with deep impact about asteroids hitting the Earth and people are getting paranoid. What if an asteroid hits the Earth? Yeah. Well, and late, lately, I think you've noticed uh, that there's one asteroid that's charged to come near the Earth by 2028. And the people's reaction is, what if it hits the Earth? What if it hits the Earth? Yeah. Well, the reaction to that is, why not mine it out of existence? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we would like to do that. Yeah, exactly. But that's, let me tell you, though, that was my first thought, is asteroid 1986 DA. It's a flying mountain of stainless steel. It's worth $80 trillion. But imagine yourself up against a stainless steel wall, a mile in every direction, and you're floating in your spacesuit, and you pull into your, your Black & Decker drill out of your belt, and you stick it up against this mountain of stainless steel, and you pull the trigger and push, what's going to happen? Free <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. 
<laughs> so, I mean, there is nothing out there that is even remotely conceived of that allows us to do anything in space in terms of mining anything. What we need to do is get the mining companies interested first and then find champions within those companies to start working on management saying, look at this little commercial company. They went out there to this trillion dollar uh, resource. Maybe we ought to be thinking about that because we're polluting the earth and we're running out of mining uh, sites and ores and, uh, and we need to be thinking about space. So this is a long term thing and it's only going to happen incrementally. We're just not there yet. Uh, first of all, how are you going to deliver this system into space? And, and second, I was wondering, do you have any pictures? We have a website. Uh, it's easy to remember if you can remember the name of the company, Space Dev. It's just www.spacedev.com. We're starting to get more graphics on there, but we're a little short on that right now. Um, something else I wanted to say will come back to me later. Oh, oh, and we have a request for information out for all, com all known commercial launch vehicles. We've heard back from about a third of them. So we will be using a commercial launch vehicle and we will ensure not only the uh, launch, of course, but also the mission itself, because we can't afford to go in the drink and not be able to recover from that. So just like communication satellite companies, we will be insured, and hopefully, uh, maybe through uh, Kirby's company. I've got about uh, three more minutes. Yeah. What about uh, ownership of the uh, asteroid? Oh, good question. Just very briefly. Oh, by the way, I'm going to go into all the details at 3 o'clock on the near-Earth asteroid prospector in great detail, any level you want. So let me skip that one, except to say being completely privately financed with not a single penny of government subsidies, when we land our private corporate representative on that asteroid, we're claiming it. Uh, we're claiming ownership of it. And you may say, who are you going to claim it with? Well, with the public, because we don't recognize any legal body in the world that has standing in space. So what we want to do is simply create a legal controversy based on property rights in space because there's not a single treaty that uh, addresses that issue, but we need to get the world thinking about property rights in space. And the only way to do that is to do a bold move and simply say, hey, we went to our risk and our expense and we assessed it and we landed on it. It's ours. And who's to say it's not? So let's have some fun with that one. That's the one that we're going to do. <laughs> One last one. That was a good point to stop. But one last well, question. Uh, continuing on that point, why uh, not only Antarctic, why uh, we have people go down there from various right. countries and uh, establish settlements, and now we have a treaty that makes that sort of a universal. Nobody right. has a part of it they own themselves. Now, can't they do the same thing on the moon, for instance? Well, you know, my theory is uh, that space is space, and it's not Earth. And uh, whoever is there first is going to be setting precedence. So let's not be wimpy about what we're trying to do yeah. and just go for broke. And then, uh, you know, we'll probably have to settle for less in the, in the long run. But why, in life, why would you ever go for anything less than the best? Or why would you ever shoot for anything that wasn't the top? So as long as we're, so as as we're going to, no. <laughs> well, when it comes to the moon and the planet, I don't think we ought to be trying to claim those just from a PR point of view. <laughs> you want to see a tap dance? <laughs> no, but there are a lot of interesting issues having to do with that, and I'm, I'm afraid I'm eating into other people's time now. So thank you very much, and come to my thing at 3 o'clock.